It's such a remarkable achievement, considered as an achievement of the human race as a whole. Cooperation from so many different parts of the world, and all driven by our curiosity about how nature works. It's, uh, it's a magnificent achievement. Uh, I mean, in the old days, people tried at the scale of that time to do such things with a somewhat different motivation. Stonehenge and cathedrals and so on and so on were also immense works for their time. But the, now it's it, the driving force is trying to understand our universe. And that's extremely impressive. That we're willing to devote that much ingenuity and that much labor and uh, in general to uh, afford uh, that amount of attention, devote that amount of attention to uh, this extraordinary enterprise. Well, I don't know that I would bet. I think that the mechanism which so many people proposed, Peter Higgs among many others, that mechanism, uh, I think, must be responsible for the generation of masses. It's what I used to call a soft mass mechanism, one that doesn't interfere with uh, the uh, disappearance of infinite corrections and so on and so on. Uh, I think that mechanism must be right. It's very hard to believe that it could be wrong. But as to there being one boson that, that uh, results from this Higgs process, that's not quite so certain because there could be more than one, in which case the experimental result would be different and they might not, have, uh, they might not be looking for it in the, in the right way for, for that. They certainly are looking in the right way for the single Higgs boson, if that turns out to be right. Uh, but there might be some more complicated version of the Higgs process in case it turns out it's not there. But I, I suppose it's more, much more likely than not that it is there. It was not really a collaboration. I had written a brief note calling attention to the ideas. There were seven experiments, I think, that contradicted our theory. And under many conditions, one might have said, well, if those, the seven experiments that show this wrong, it must be wrong. But it was so beautiful and so simple and so elegant that we concluded it was right anyway. And in fact, all those experiments were wrong. <laughs> Either wrong or wrongly interpreted. In any case, they didn't disprove the idea. But it's fascinating that uh, beauty and elegance can be a successful criterion for judging a theory in fundamental physics. Why should that be so? And I've written a paper about that. Well, one might argue that. One might argue that. That's possible. Uh, Supersymmetry would be very helpful in many ways, it turns out to be right. Uh, when you have large mass ratios in a quantum field theory, heavy particles versus light ones, and the same, playing the same sorts of roles, it's very difficult when you calculate uh, to all the orders of perturbation theory when you calculate uh, fairly exactly what happens, uh, it's very hard to keep those ratios large. They tend to, masses tend to approach each other. Uh, and, uh, but this doesn't happen if you have broken supersymmetry, provided the breaking isn't too bad, provided the violation of supersymmetry isn't too serious. So this is 
great hope among theorists that it will turn out to be true that there's broken supersymmetry and not too badly broken either. Uh, that would explain why uh, the theory tolerates these large ratios of masses. And maybe it's true uh, that we have it, that we have a bro bro supersymmetry that's broken but not too badly, in which case one should observe uh, particles that are partners of the known particles with the opposite uh, so-called statistics, the opposite behavior with respect to occupying the same state at the same time. The electron is an example of what we call a fermion. It's a particle such that two of them can't stand to be in the same state at the same time. Uh, the photon is an example of a boson, which loves to be in the same state as another boson. <laughs> and uh, of these two kinds of particles, fermions and bosons, what su broken supersymmetry tells you is that for every known particle, there must be a, a so far unknown one to be discovered, which uh, has the opposite behavior. So the super partner of a fermion is a boson, and the super partner of a boson is a fermion. And we have to look for those particles, and that's what's happening here. And who knows, maybe they're beginning to see one or two of them. But we have to wait for firmer results. Can't decide anything on the basis of rumor. We have to wait for uh, seriously announced results. The number of us uh, who were connected with New Mexico, frequently by being consultants at the, at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, or some people who actually worked there, we decided that uh, we wanted to have an institute in uh, the vicinity of Santa Fe, or in Santa Fe, New Mexico itself, because we loved the area so much. And we wanted it to be different from Los Alamos in the sense that it wouldn't be a government-run lab, it wouldn't be responsible for weapons design or anything of that kind. It would be a serious scientific institution mostly theoretical, although there might be some observational work. It would be mostly devoted to theory. And I emphasize strongly, as a member of that uh, club that created this institute, uh, I argued strongly for having science represented very broadly, not only physical science, but biological sciences, biomedical sciences, if you like. Uh, and social and behavioral science, and even human history, which can be regarded as a science. And uh, we've done, done that, more or less. We have a very varied, uh, very varied program covering all sorts of scientific fields. But another aspect that I emphasized strongly was that people with different scientific backgrounds should be able to collaborate and work on things that might not be what they studied when they were young, but something else. Uh, so there would be spontaneously formed research groups composed of people from, with different backgrounds. At least one of them should know something about the subject, but not necessarily all. They might just bring their ways of thinking and their, their ideas and so on and so forth from other fields uh, with the hope that that might uh, create some uh, interesting uh, interactions that would lead to progress. And that's so far proved to be true. Uh, many of our researchers are young and uh, starting their careers, first few years of postdoctoral work, for example. And we were worried initially about what would happen to them. Suppose they wanted jobs in academic life, in universities, uh, for example. Uh, would there be any? Because these people would be interdisciplinary. They wouldn't have achievements in specific traditional fields, 
but they would have worked on these collaborations among different fields, would they be able to get jobs in academic life? Well, we needn't have worried. <laughs> All of our brilliant postdocs who wanted to be uh, in academic life have found excellent jobs at excellent universities, if that's what they wanted. Others, of course, have gone into industrial labs and so on and so on, if they wanted that. But the ones who wanted to be in academic life have succeeded very well. But we had no way of predicting in what field they would be appointed to academic jobs. So we had one, uh, one young man trained in physics who became a full professor of sociology at Columbia University, which is a very excellent university in New York City. Uh, and of course, being a professor of sociology, he had to teach a course in sociology. And he went to his classroom for the first day of classes, and that was the first day he had ever been in a sociology class. And he was the professor. <laughs> another, uh, another one was a, uh, another person trained in physics, a collaborator of mine, actually, uh, became a full professor of mechanical engineering at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, another wonderful place. And uh, he's very happy there. Uh, he works mostly on ideas about quantum computing. And so he refers to himself as a professor of quantum mechanical engineering. And uh, again, he had to teach a course in mechanical engineering. And he went to do that, entered the classroom, and that was the first time he had ever been in a mechanical engineering classroom. <laughs> so there is this group of people out there that yearn to collaborate with people from other disciplines and solve problems that require that kind of uh, work together. It seems to be OK. It seems to be successful. And a number of uh, important uh, results have been achieved so far, and I hope there will be even more in the future. Well, uh, not necessarily. Uh, maybe even the reverse, because uh, elementary particle physics is concerned with elementary particles. And of course, we've changed our minds over the years about what is an elementary particle. People used to think the neutron and proton were elementary, and uh, we uh, sabotaged that by uh, working with quarks, which are constituents of the neutron and proton and other hadrons. Uh, the, uh, but the list looks long, and to some people may look complicated. But actually, it's not necessarily the list of particles that measures the complexity, but the rather the uh, how long it takes to describe the theory. And we don't know exactly what theory governs this uh, domain. So far, most of the advances have actually simplified the picture. Even though the number of particles has grown, the picture into which they fit looks simpler. But it's still not that simple. And maybe we will ultimately find a unified theory of all the particles and all the forces that is really simple. And it wouldn't matter how long the list is. The list may, in fact, be infinite. There may be an infinite number of elementary objects. But if the theory takes only a short time to describe, then it's not very complex. Well, I wouldn't apply it, the argument just to art and physics. I would say that uh, there are all these uh, activities, human activities, that represent uh, remarkable achievements. Uh, some of them are in art, various arts, uh, in music, in literature, in painting, in all sorts of artistic pursuits. Some of them are in science. Some of them are in other things. Some of them are in commercial enterprise, uh, inventing and designing magnificent things that people want and that give them pleasure and so on and so forth. There are so many different kinds of creative activities in which people engage. And I think they're all related. 
And uh, we should appreciate them all in the same way, so to speak. Uh, different facets of uh, uh, creative human activity. I don't want to make a sharp distinction between the uh, scientific, uh, uh, between scientific creation uh, and artistic creation, uh, or distinctions from the other kinds as well. I think they're all, uh, they all belong together and they constitute a very noble human enterprise.